Is it on already? Yep. Okay. Just now. Second Corinthians Bible study. And we are in chapter 12, right, Terry? Yes. Chapter 12. And just want to welcome everybody here live stream with us. And also those of you that are here in person. We've got pizza tonight. We've got sausage pizza and pepperoni pizza. So you help yourself. We've got the the root beer over here, that's the hard stuff, just the real sugar in it, so go ahead and help yourself with that. And there's also some uh, caffeine-free Coke over here in case you don't want to stay up all night. Okay, so, uh, and again, there's some prayer, prayer requests. Pray for Carlene, if you will. We had our, our visit yesterday, and they found that they couldn't use right now the, the uh, Picray new medicine that's out on her because right now they've got to reduce the dosage and they don't know how much to reduce it by until she gets some uh, lab work done. And so it may, she may be off of it a week or two, so they don't know yet. But but she is she did get her shots uh, that she has to have for the anti-hormone. Because uh, cancer loves the, the feminine hormones and, the, and cancer also loves sugar. So those are the things that uh, they're trying to yeah, yeah, bread, yeah. Anything starchy like that. So, uh, anyway, just pray for Carlene. And also, Rodney had his uh, colonoscopy today, and he said everything looked good. So, they, they did send a biopsy out, which is the norm, normal thing to do now. And uh, But they look like it's going to go well enough that uh, with what his uh, colonoscopy shows is that. Uh, so, they're going to go now to the point of doing the shoulder. So, he has to have a new shoulder uh, in there because the old one... Four. And, and it, uh, he, he, needs that. he needs that. So that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks, I think. All right. And also, James had a situation with having to see the doctor, right? Yeah. Uh, did you go to ER? Or no. Uh, what to see your doctor? I don't know. the doctor in a while. She had a nerve. She had a nerve, nerve problem. Yeah. 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 They don't know what's up in March. Okay. I had a nerves, nerve damage in my legs. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and some of that runs in the family, as you know, with Ben and Ben, my uh, my dad's brother Floyd, 23, passed away at 23. What's that? Just the weather. I th- yeah, it, weather will do that. Man, it's cold weather makes your old joints hurt, don't they? And even your young ones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Would you like to do that? Okay. So take you down there. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Pastor, can we pray for my mom, too, because she's still in the hospital. Still in the hospital. Wow. Are they making any headway there? Well, I think a little bit. Okay. I mean, she seems to, to get better a little bit, and then it goes back the other way. Pray for James, a mother, and um, she's been in there for, what, two or three weeks now, right? Two. Two weeks? Okay, so let's pray for them. And uh, James, want to leave some prayer? Or I'm about Terry. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are there for us, that you are our great healer, that you just know what we are going to call upon you for all, all the time, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you would have mercy on us, that you would forgive us our sins, Lord, and help us to be focused on you. We pray, Father, that you would just be, that we could be used for your glory, Father, and that we lift up uh, James and Jane and Carlene, Father, and others we haven't mentioned, Father, we just thank you for answered prayers also as well. And Lord, we just pray you could have uh, uh, continued uh, prayer for these people, Lord, that you would continue to keep your hands upon them, that you would just give us uh, a miracle, Father, uh, that they can be used as uh, instruments for you, Lord, to glorify you. And we just uh, know that your will will be done. And we give this all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cherry. Did you want something, Cherry? Oh, water I'm going to get my pardon. So we're going to be beginning at uh, verse 14. But we need to recap on a little bit of this. So, what we read last week, uh, which was starting with the 11th verse, got into some of Paul's boasting that he was doing. Uh, he felt kind of foolish about it because he wouldn't try to boast about Jesus. But the 
Uh, interesting thing is it brought out a lot of the good signs about an apostle. Yes, and when you say the word boasting, we look at it as a as a bad word in our language today. But actually what he was using the word for is to verify, verify his apostleship, to verify that he was a missionary and being used of God because there were others that were trying to say they were missionaries or they were preachers or apostles that were not God's people. And so he was trying to show a difference there, a good difference, right, Terry? Yes. So go right ahead. Would you want to continue? Yeah, and so I also wanted to know that uh, Paul could also point out some of these signs and wonders and his deeds that were accomplished. And these, these were actually accomplished among the, the Corinthian Christians. And he, each of these were evidence of Paul's apostolic standing. So it was you know, just a feeling that Paul had in his heart. And he, he, you know, he definitely had a love for the Corinthian Christians because he's been on two other trips. And as we begin tonight, we're going to be talking about his the plan for his third trip to Corinthian, the Corinthian church now. So we'll continue now and we'll read the first, uh, well, verses 14 through 18. We're ready for that? Ready. Okay. Uh, on the 12th uh, chapter of 2 Corinthians, we're reading at verse 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very, very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But be it so, I do not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? And so now this was Paul's third time uh, that he's preparing to come. It says on his first visit in Corinth, Paul founded the church and stayed there a year and six months. On his second visit, it was a more painful experience where he visited between uh, the writing of 2 Corinthians, and the 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Now he's prepared to come the third time. And so Paul lets the Corinthians know that when he comes, he's going to receive, he will receive a collection for the saints in Judea. So he's hoping that they'll get some kind of collection from the Corinthians. He will not receive money uh, from them for his personal support. And that was one thing that really frustrated those false apostles because, you know, they they were there for the money. They were there trying to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish with the Corinthians. With that. But Paul was not doing it for money. He had his own personal support. With that. So he continued you know, with his previous practice among the Corinthians and uh, was able to support himself and not create a burden, burden for the Corinthians. And even even nowadays, I think we've, even the pastor has kind of given up some of his uh, income for the, you know, to just to support the church and some of the burden is on us, which is acceptable because we should be in there providing support for the church with that. But Paul continued to be uh, faithful with this and it says in the uh, part of the fourth, that 14th verse, it says for I do not seek yours but you. It says this is a testimony of every godly minister. They do not serve for what they can get from they can get from God's people but what they can give to God's people and they are shepherds. Just wondering if anything you want to add to this. Well, uh, he was he was he was taking up a, an offering or collection for the other churches, right. not for himself, but all but for the churches that were also in need at this time, and so he was giving this out. But we we do want to make uh, say a word about the fact that Paul many times was working in the communities where 
he was actually ministering. Does anybody know what Paul was doing? And I'm gonna, I know you know. But I, but some of you want to make a guess at what Paul was doing, or maybe some of you know what his what his uh, work was that he would do in some of these communities where he was setting up churches. He made something. What would it be? A tent maker. A tent maker. That's right, Jane. You get the prize. <laughs> Have all the pizza you want tonight. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, but he was a tent maker. So it's not unusual for pastors that are going uh, to or, or in communities that are not doing as well economically as others. It's not unusual for pastors, preachers, or missionaries to be bivocational. By the way, I've been bivocational all my life. My ministry has been to take uh, down and out churches, restore them by putting people in position, helping them do discipleship. Uh, with the, disciple the people, help them to grow, help the church to grow, do what you need to do with the building to make it more presentable. And all these things are part of doing what you need to do when you are helping a church to grow. And many times all, all I would get would be gas money. And then I would turn around and give that gas money back to the church in the offering plate. I mean, it's that that's the sacrifice that you do sometimes to make a church grow or to help it grow, to do God's work. It's not about the money. Because there are eternal rewards, right? There's eternal rewards. But this is what you have to do sometimes, and self-sacrifice. And so Paul was willing to do that, and the offering that he was taking up was not necessarily for he and his work, but for the places where he was going, so he could help those churches that were new or struggling or just, just plain struggling, even if they weren't as new as the others. So anybody got any questions about that? By vocational ministry, possibly, as we're talking about that. Now, he wasn't always working as a tent maker as far as, he didn't always have to be as by vocational as he was in some places. It all depended upon the economy in that area. And so, and it does depend on that now. Now, for a while, the church was supporting me somewhat. And then, as the pandemic came along, we realized we're not going to make it. In our mortgage, that's not a good sign. So that's when I pulled away and said, don't pay me anything, okay? And so that's what it's been now. And don't know if you'll ever get to a place where you can afford to pay me anything, okay? But it doesn't matter. I'm here anyway because this is what God has for me to do. So, um, Terry, do you have anything you want to share about this? Well, I was going to say, this is also the same thing for the heart of Jesus because, you know, sometimes we often think that uh, God really wants us uh, Anyway, he has, he, has, he wants to use us for something, but actually uh, he really wants us. And so Jesus selflessly seeks out our good. You know, what, what is he looking for? And what do we have to offer? I mean, he, Jesus sacrificed it all in that case. But we need to really take a look at this situation and decide that, hmm, where is our heart? Okay. To follow Go ahead. I was going to say that with these new ministers he was bringing up, he was he was mentoring Titus and Timothy, young ministers in the Lord. And as he was doing that, he had to teach them by example. And his example here is don't think you're something. Don't think, oh, don't overrate yourself. Don't, uh, we need to remember to be humble. We need to be able to work and willing to work if we need to do that. In the by vocationally, he was teaching them. And he was not only teaching them by word, but by example. So this was good that he was able to do that. Uh, so that kind of goes with the widow who was given the tithe of the temple. She uh, gave the land out of her pocket. Of her pocket mm -hmm. when, the, when, when the apostles were looking yeah, on. He said she actually gave more than the rich people. Mm -hmm. because she gave all she had and they were just given. They had plenty of it was given. So she actually gave more but she gave all of it. And that was, those were in the words of Jesus himself. She's given more than you want, and they were. I mean, you can imagine. Here she is, a, a, a widower that was not a widow that was not that didn't have much to offer, but she got, gave. And Jesus said, "She's giving all that she has." We don't know. We shouldn't judge how people give and whether or not they're giving what they need to give, because God gives us an example of how to give. Now, as a pastor, uh, by vocational, I don't take anything from the church, any payment at all. But yet I still, as I work, I tithe off what I make 
at work. See, I mean, this, this is the guideline that God gives us. You should pay tithes and offerings. Tithes are 10% of whatever our income is, whatever our increase is, is what God's Word says. So if you've got an increase, tithe off of it. Can you outgive God? What do you think? <laughs> no, not at all. And does God not promise us in Malachi that he'll keep the devourer away? Have, we, have you? How many of you have experienced the devourer, Satan as the devourer, when you seem like you've made some money and you think that you're getting ahead, you're actually saving some stuff. There you go. Yeah, Zach says, yeah, and James and myself also, Terry, which seems like, well, we've got some money put away now. We're in pretty good shape. But it doesn't mean that you are. We just have to trust God to keep that devourer away. And God's word says in Malachi, he will give back to us as we give our tithes and offerings. He will give back to us pressed down, heaped up and running over and he'll keep the devourer away. So part of the blessing is not just getting back monetarily. It's also getting back in every way that God can bless us, right? He can bless our health and take care of us. He can, he can bless us in so many different ways other than just financially too. So anybody have anything to share about this? What do you think? It's, it's important that, that we remember that part of it. It's amazing what God can do uh, and say, what Satan wants to do to us. He wants to tear us up. He wants to... He, uh, by the way, don't you think Satan wants to try to devour our resources? If he can, he will. And that's what God's Word says. He's called the devourer. That's just another name for Satan, the devourer. You know, he wants to do it. He can do it. He's done it to a lot of people. I've seen people with really good jobs come into a world of hurt, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, it can happen. And it can turn, all you have to do is go to the hospital a few times. <coughs> that wipes you out pretty fast, don't it? It really does. So, <clears throat> go ahead, Cherry. Uh, another part there in that 14th verse, it talks about, For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And Paul uses this to explain the reason why he did not want to receive support. He saw himself as kind of a spiritual father and the Corinthians as the spiritual children. So he did not want to put burden on them with that. It was in a, in a sense, they should not feel burdened to support him. So that was the whole purpose uh, with that, as far as with that um, particular part of verse four, 14. He was setting a good example, wasn't he? Right. <clears throat> So since Paul did uh, gratefully receive support from other churches, uh, we know this is uh, not his policy towards all churches. Instead, as it is with Paul, he's saying, you Corinthians are not mature enough to support me. So spiritually, it was, we were not mature enough. And it says, you're still uh, spiritual children. It says, when you grow up, uh, some... Uh, you can part, be partners with me and work and support and support me. So he was hoping that the, on his third uh, trip that he would make, that the Corinthian churches would, you know, repent, uh, especially for those who were not not repentant, uh, but for those who were not repentant, it was going to come down pretty hard. Well, he was also referring to the churches as maturing, but they were babes. You know, they were coming along as babes, and now here Paul is talking to them again about support. And he wanted them to understand, okay, some of these lesser churches that can't afford much, some of these newer churches, these baby churches, we know that they might not be able to afford to do much. So he's taking up a collection to help some of these others, and he wants them to, comparing that to what it means as a, as a father, as you as a father, as you're thinking about the future and your children, wouldn't it be sad if you didn't have anything to leave your family? Now, it doesn't have to be monetarily. I'm saying, listen, if you've got Bibles, now, there used to be some stigma about, don't write in your Bible, that's God's Word, you know. No, that's foolish. Because one of the most precious things that people have left other people are Bibles that they've studied, that they have written and made notes, and, and things that meant something to them. And one of the most precious Bible things that Bibles have today uh, are, or they in the past too, 
trying to find one that has it here, and most of them do, or some of them used to, uh, all the time. Here, here's one. This Bible has deaths. You write deaths down. You know, births has births and marriages, all these things in the Bibles. So you want to, here's marriages, occasions to remember. When you get a good family Bible or a Bible that is a little bit above what some of them are, it's nice if you can get one that has these things because sometimes all you have left of the family memory might just be a Bible that's got important dates in it. What do you think about that? I just found, by the way, I was telling you, James, about my, uh, would be my Uncle Floyd, my dad's brother, who died at 23. Nobody really knew much about that situation. My dad is gone. Uh, he could have told me a little bit more, but I didn't think to ask him a whole lot about it. But I knew that he is paralyzed and that he, from the waist down, and it was bothering his upper body by the time he died. And I always thought he died in his 30s. No, I just found a paper in one of the Bibles that was actually a, a section of the front of a Bible that Eli, my dad's dad, had that apparently he wore it out. And so May said, my, my grandmother, my grandmother thought, well, I don't want this thing to go missing in action. So she took the front of that Bible, what was left of the Bible, and took it and put it in there. And I'm flipping through the Bible that, that my dad gave me of May, his mother, and here it had the front of Eli's Bible in it that had the places where occasions, important occasions, deaths, and marriage, and all that. And here, he, Floyd, 23 years when he died. 23, 23 years old. See how important it is? If you have to use a Bible with memory sections in it, marriages and births, it's good because how much do you think we need to depend on family history when it comes to physical, medical, family history? Do you think we need to know that? Absolutely. It can help the doctors out tremendously. I still remember going to the Lutheran Hospital in Indiana and going to visit my friend Aaron. I went to college with him and visiting his mother over there. They were getting ready to do, do surgery. They didn't know why she was all paralyzed and, and why she was beginning now to not be able to use her, even feed herself. They were getting ready to put her in surgery. And then somebody had the idea, but how much blood work have you really done? Well, maybe not enough. So they did some more blood work and found out she was totally, almost totally deficient in vitamin B. B12. Oh, B. B12. I know it's G. No, that's, that, that one's a bad one to be deficient in. My son Ben is deficient in vitamin D. But B12 will cause you to be paralyzed. And so, and I mentioned that to my doctor. You know, maybe have we, have we anybody checked that? Maybe you could check my, because I'm low on energy and everything. Did you know it can keep you from healing from injuries if you don't have the vitamin B12 there? And it can cause you to go paralyzed. And by the way, before doing that surgery, they did that blood test on Aaron's mom and found out she was almost totally deficient in B12. And they gave her shots of it right away, put her in the nursing home for recovery and put her on a regimen of that. And she regained all of her motions her ability except her legs. She always had to use a walker after that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I'm that it's, it's important. It's important to to make sure we leave a legacy, even if it's a page in the Bible that has a marriages and deaths and things, or sermons that you like, somebody that preached, the pastor that preached, whatever, something that meant something to you. Okay, I think I've beat that horse long enough, right? My wife says, "Don't beat that dead horse." <laughs> <laughs> my wife. Okay. I had so, a Bible from my grandpa from Korea. Oh, really? Yes. You know, just that had to be things. things Did he have things. some things in there that he? Had well, it's written. I just haven't looked through the details. Oh, that's amazing okay. to think you know, he had written that. Boy, really bad stuff was going on. Oh well, and I'm sure he was using that Bible <laughs> to try to make it through those days. Don't you think? And there's an old saying in the military. Um, how does it say, uh, don't ever get into a foxhole with anybody braver than you are. <laughs> get you killed. Uh, and uh, there's no atheist in the foxholes. Those, those are sayings from the military. Where did you hear those from? Me? My grandpa. Oh, really? How about that? Most military people know some of those old sayings like that. But it makes good sense, doesn't it? And when people get in the line of fire, I mean, literally... 
Yeah, they're going to be praying. They're going to be seeking God. I'm telling you, I've seen death or the fear of death make a difference in people's lives. As a hospice chaplain, especially, I've seen them turn to God. And sometimes, sometimes they've waited too long, but many times they can come to the Lord. And it's good to see that. Well, what, where are we at now, Terry? Look, he's holding his, he's tightening his lips. He just can't hardly stand it because I'm on a rabbit trail and I'm not jumping off. Go ahead. I'm just letting you go with it. <laughs> <laughs> go right ahead now. Give me about a minute here. I need to find out where we left off. Oh, no, that's okay. We got it here. <clears throat> so anyway, we were on uh, verse, getting into verse 15. And there's a phrase here. It says, the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. And you can't even really have to think about that. Paul was basically saying that, yes, it really hurts me that, you know, you're, you're spending more time with the false apostles and believing what they're saying. But he says, that doesn't hurt me. He says, he, he feels the pain, but it doesn't cripple him. It doesn't rob him of his joy. It doesn't rob him of his service. He said he would uh, gladly uh, spend um, and be spent for his time with the Corinthian Christians, he wasn't going to give up on them with that. So I thought, that is one strong messenger of God. That is, if you look at that, that's a pretty important look. That's a pretty important way to look at things. Uh, I, I really, he would say, I really enjoy, I really like that I can spend my time, my life with you. I can be spent for you. I'm doing these things for you. And but then he says. But I, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be loved back by you, like I'm loving you. Now, that's an important concept there. Should the basis that we know we're going to be loved back be our basis for helping other people? Not at all. That's not the godly way to look at it. We, sometimes we have to help people that just don't get it, you know, that it just goes right over their heads. You're helping them. You're trying to do what God wants you to do for them. And it might go over their heads right now, but it may just kick in one day and they'll go, why, why, did they, why were they so good to me? You know, why? And, and so it may just be that they'll see the importance of God in their lives or what God wants of them during the time that you're helping them, even though they, they may not even see the reason to love you back. They may not see the necessity of it. Now let's look at that closely for just a moment. Did you know some parents don't know how to love their children? And if they do love them, they don't, might not love them the right way. So I have a problem with hugs. I don't know, many of you know, how many of you know I have a problem with hugs? Okay, now the problem is, it's okay. <laughs> are you touching me? Oh, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> All right, but listen. And, and I did not know this. Didn't know about the severity. I'm just helping you out a little bit. Till I walked into my in-laws' house. Actually, we were, my Carly and I were still dating, and I came to visit one day. And the family had gotten to know me a little bit. And I walked in one day, and they just like it was a swarm. Like, thinking, ah, you know. Of course, I'm tightening up, you know. And and I'm not. I was not used to it. Now I did not know this, and I did not know. Carlene had to point it out, you know, what's wrong with you that, you know, we're just a loving family. I'm thinking, well, I'm from a loving family. We shake hands and everything, you know. We'll say, we'll, we'll hug mom and dad, you know, and especially mom. And then I didn't realize that my dad, I saw him shoo my youngest brother away one day. And uh, he, my youngest brother had gotten up on the couch. For one thing, he shouldn't have been on the couch, okay. That's, not, that's a no-no in the house we were raised in. But he got up on the couch and he gave dad a hug and dad said, get down, you're too old for that. I said, what? So here was dad pushing him away as he was trying to get a hug. Now it may be that the furniture thing might have been a little bit a part of that or maybe he was feeling like Chris being a little bit clingy at his age, I don't know. But let's look at it. Then I thought back a while after that, I thought, what? I wonder how many times that happened to me when I was a little one. What do you think? Uh -huh. Yes, it can happen, can't it? Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful as, as people that are God's people that we are not one of those people that think that we can't love the unlovable. Sometimes we just have to love the unlovable. Have you ever loved an unlovable person? Have you tried to? It's not easy, is it? No. It's not easy, but, but what? Okay, never mind. But some of you, 
have to know what that's about. Now, as parents, we need to be able to love the kids, even so sometimes they don't deserve to be loved. And how many of you would say, hey, there are times I didn't deserve to be loved by mom and dad. I know that. Raise your hands. I want to see you. Don't lie to me. Oh, yeah. When you say you always deserve to be loved, oh, sure. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you can see that. Okay. I'm glad that you can see that we don't always deserve to be loved. But the fact is, our parents, just because we might not deserve it, they still love us. Now, and my dad, in his own way, he loved us too. And I remember, did any of you ever hear this phrase, I'm only doing, I'm only, I'm only going to punish you because I, I love you that much. Uh, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't punish you, right? You've heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah. And so these things, and I still remember my mom must have loved me so much. I, I remember one time I was out of the area where I shouldn't have been and down and, and downtown in an area where I wasn't supposed to be out of the sight of our house. We lived right downtown, by the way, but I was too far away, and she, they were looking for me. I must have been supper time or something. I wouldn't know where to be found. And, and Mom, back then, they had switches. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember Mom had a switch, and it seemed like about every step I took, she hit me with that switch on the back of the leg. And she could be pretty tough sometimes on us, but she was very loving. But she was terrified. She, as a parent, as a, now as that a you parent. know if your kid's been gone for five seconds, she was terrified. And I understood that. Now. Yeah. She yeah, made me make did. sure. But I, now I understand yeah. it better than ever. But yeah. back then I thought she might be a little bit too harsh on me. But she was terrified. So that's, I mean, that's, that's true. <laughs> she reacted. Because when your kid is yeah. gone and you don't know where they're at, yeah. I was just talking to Carlene last night about, and, and uh, a friend of ours came to visit last night after we got back from the uh, James Center. And, and I was saying, because uh, my friend knew the same person I knew from high school, Larry Bunch was his name. And Larry and I went bike riding. And you've been bike riding before. Did you ever notice how time can get away from you when you're bike riding? Because uh -huh. you're going in an area, scenic area that you haven't been to, or maybe ever. And so we were riding around. And it was late in the afternoon, past supper time, and I wasn't home. Yeah. And, they, and my dad called the police on me. Yeah. He was in the sheriff's department too, so he knew a lot of people. So he just, you know, hey, he's not here, but go be on the lookout for him. And, and so I got home apparently before the police found me. But he said, you know, I called the cops on you. He said, because I didn't know where you were. He said, don't ever do that to me again. I thought, what? How many of you ever had anything like that happen? The authority, somebody called the authority on you. There you go. Because you made, and, and it, it was because. What's that? Oh. <laughs> All right. Leave the bin. So, but that, sometimes it's necessary because we have walked out from the boundaries that we should be walking in. And I learned, hey, all you have, and Dad said, all you had to do was tell us where you, where you were going and how long you'd be gone. You didn't say any of that. Okay. Now I know. But now you have your own kids and your own grandchildren, and you know that if they're gone, they can be terrified that something There you happens. go. And so kids, <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Let, let your parents or your grandparents know if you're, gonna, if you're going someplace, whether you should go, whether you can't go or not, you I should be communicating. Good. So this is, what, this is what Paul was talking about right here. There's, we have to communicate love, and sometimes when we communicate that love, People don't understand us communicating that love. Sometimes that love comes in different forms, such as a verbal training that we're giving people, and it can be seem kind of harsh sometimes. And the first thing out of our mouth sometimes when authority, like parents or grandparents, tell you to do something, well, and, and the first thing out of the mouth of the kids or the grandkids would be, don't you trust me? All right. How many of you said that to your parents? Don't you trust me? You know what the answer always was? Well, no. <laughs> Not as far as I can remember. And, and sometimes that is, that's what you hear. So here Paul is trying to share, share with them, I'm telling you these things because I love you. I'm doing these things because I love you as a church and as individuals. I love you. And I'm not doing these things because I expect you to love me back in the same manner. 
He knew better. He knew that it wasn't going to happen because some of these people were very immature. They were newer churches, churches he had planted, and they weren't mature enough yet to know how to respond to the kind of love he was showing them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, anybody got anything to share about that or add to it? No. I think well, this I is a I got a whole different story on uh, when I ran away one time. Well, what was the story you My got? parents knew me very well, and one time I got upset. I said, I'm going to run away. I said, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I rode my favorite spot, uh, which actually the high school wasn't there at the time. So I rode down there and I was sitting on this stump. I was sitting there. This isn't any fun. So I went back home. So I had a supper time, but I'm missing it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I ran away one time. I ran, I ran away one time. I went out the back door and I went down a block. And then in that block, there was a big parking lot. In the, and then there was a house. My brother ended up getting renting an apartment there when he first married. And in that a big apartment building, there was a stoop and a stairway that started in. And then there was a, a place, an overhang that would keep you nice and dry if it were raining or something. And it wasn't nice weather anyway. But I was sitting out there and I thought, I was out there about 45 minutes to an hour. I thought, this is crazy. What am I accomplishing here? You know, besides that, I'm going to miss supper. So I hope God made it home. But I thought, you know, I'm going to teach them a lesson. Did you ever think of that? I'm going to do something. I'm going to make them miss me. I'm going to make them want me to have me around, and, and they're going to miss me. I'm going to teach them a lesson. You know, that's crazy stuff, isn't it? The funny part is they always wanted you around. And what? The funny part is they've always wanted you. Who? Parents. Parents. Yeah. They want do want you around, but they yeah. know you'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're right. They did make me understand and help me realize that, yes, they did want me around. And they probably did that with you, too. Now, they may have said things that may have sounded cruel or harsh or unloving, but honestly, they want the kids around. We want the grandkids around. We want you all. I want the church members around. I miss you when you're not here. You see what I mean? Yeah. But sometimes... Maybe the love that we give out as people that are in authority, like parents or pastors or ministers, sometimes that love is not returned. Now, what does that mean when that love is not returned? What does it mean to you? Does it mean that should be something that you should weigh as so important that you're going to stop doing what you're doing? No. You've got to realize, wait a minute, we're not, who are we really doing this for? God. When you're loving your wife, when you're loving your husband, and you do it in the frame of mind that you belong to God, you can love them the way God wants you to love them, but that love may not always be returned. you got to remember that. Now, as kids, the love may not always be returned when we're loving on our parents. They may, they may push you off the couch, you know. So you may have a phobia about hugs the rest of your life, okay? But still... Carlene says, but you're working on it, Tony. You're working on it. You're getting better at it. I think I am. It's taken me 43 years. But 43 years of marriage. Now, I never had any problem hugging her or her hugging me. It was the other people that, you know, you know what I'm saying? It was the other people that were real huggy that I didn't know real well or, you know, I don't know. I just can't. I'm still working on it. But anyway, uh, tell me what else you can think about about this section here. Anybody else got anything? Being shown love with with expecting nothing in return. I mean, you're not you may not always get it, but that's part of just doing what's right. Don't you think that's it? Yeah, I actually saw a thing right behind the courthouse, and I took a picture of it because I thought it was so awesome. They had a coat rack hung up, and I thought they had a sale or something. I didn't know what they were doing. And I walked by and looked, and it said, "If you need it, if you have an extra coat, leave it. If you need one, take one." And they had a whole rack is behind the courthouse. They had a whole rack of coats. Donate them. That's right. all. It's it's right. It's at the identity salon right behind the courthouse. Salon. Mm -hmm. The salon that's right behind the courthouse. Oh, how about but that? That's neat. Mercy. Yeah, and, it's, and they're doing that. Like they're not gonna know. I mean, they're gonna notice that the coats are gone, but they're not gonna know who got it or who needed right. it. Or they're doing that out of love and not out of oh well, I'm gonna look good because I gave him a coat. You know, they've like, got the right purpose. Yeah, in like, I this, thought it was. I just thought it was. The calls is collecting clothes and gives them away too, by the way. Yeah. And sometimes accessories and things, you know, whatever. Yeah. But uh, people that do this without desert, without re expecting return, 
That's love. Uh -huh. As a parent, you do things for those kids, and you might as well realize we're not going to get the kind of love back sometimes that we give out. But, but they can learn from it, though, and they can learn how to be a parent because of it, right? So it's, it's important. In front of the courthouse? Behind the courthouse, towards the Mercer Savings Bank. Across the street from the bank. See, see her afterwards. Yeah. She'll, she'll fill you in, okay? Yeah. And there's a church in Portland, Indiana, that uh, does that similarly. They have like a, you know, it looks like a little, yeah, you know a little house that has shelves in it, and then it, they just put food in there, and if anybody wants food, they can take it, and if they want to put food in there, they can do that as well. So it's just yeah, an ongoing, awesome. constant thing. Yeah. That's pretty neat. That's what you want to see. Um, <clears throat> So, Paul, I think I, I think you said it well. I don't know how you said it, but it sounded really good the way you said that. But Paul was trying to teach us all to love without respect of whether it's not for us. It's for God. It's for God's cause that he's given us. Love people so they can see God, that God can be glorified in how we're loving other people. So, <clears throat> then what, what else does he say here? Well, Paul does that largely just because he's, you know, he's trying to follow Jesus Christ. And, gee, just think of all the things that we do that would just make Jesus cringe. But he yeah. continues to love us no matter what. Well, Paul goes into a little bit more detail here. He said, but be it so, even though I don't always get love back or the way that it, it seems like the more I do for you, the less you love me. Now, by the way, as a pastor, I've experienced some things. Let me tell you something. Some of the people, now, and parents can, re can reflect on this, or you can, maybe in the, even in the workplace. Some of the people that you have helped the most mm -hmm. seem to be the ones that appreciate you the least. Yeah, or the people that you help the most and, and occupy more of your time than anybody else sometimes can be the people that hurt you mm -hmm. the most. Do yeah, you know that? Yeah. And so this is what I've experienced as a pastor. Some of the very people that I've helped, I, you know, weren't there to help me later. I'm just saying this. I mean, when you come out of church and your seats are slashed, that's not a good thing. Church splits can be hard and painful. When things, those things happen, you get people who take sides and love somebody more than another, supposedly. And, and, and all these things can be hard. And having your tires flattened when you come out. I, I've had have somebody put a note under your door, your pastor's door. In child writing, accusing me of being like Jim Jones, and where's the Kool Aid at? We're just waiting on. You know, I mean, stuff. Can you believe people do that to pastors? Yeah, Jane said, Yeah, I can believe that. Come on, you <laughs> No, it happens. And I'm not the Lone Ranger here. I've heard some horror stories. One man from the state came and uh, gave us an award for the fastest growing Sunday school in the state of Ohio when I was at First Baptist Church. But but he said, uh, I said, well, how do you handle this when, you, when you're going to have a split? And I knew we were going to have one. I already knew we were going to have one. I said, what do you do when you have a split? And, and then some of these people, you know, are, you know, they just, they, it's hurtful. And do you know what he told me? He said, uh, Pastor, here's what you do. He said, did you know as, as, a, as a missionary, as a worker for the state, he ended up having to go back to the same church. One of the same, the, the same church where he had a split, and he said, and you know some of those people stabbed me in the back, he said. He stabbed me in the back. And he said, I had to go back there and preach a revival to them, and they had come up to me and shake my hand like nothing ever happened. Like, oh, you know, it just loved me to death. I'm so glad. And he said, it was so hard. He said he had to bite his tongue, and he had to let God show him how to love those people. Yeah. Can you believe that some people don't know how wrong they are when they're doing some of those things? When they're stabbing people in the back, when they're saying bad things about God's people. Can you believe sometimes they might not know how bad they're doing? Apparently. I don't think they don't realize how damaging their words and their actions can be. You know, you, you can kill people's character. You may, not have, you may not have to kill them physically, but you can kill their character. And that can damage them the rest of their lives if you're not careful. So he said, yeah, I had to go back to the same church, and they acted like nothing was wrong. And the same people that stabbed me in the back were shaking my hands and hugging me. He said, that was hard. And he said, and I said, well, what did you learn from that? He said, you know what I learned from that? Caution. Caution. I want you to know that 
some people may not and will not treat you right even though you love them the way God wants you to. But be cautious. because Learn caution. Know that some people, listen, may take advantage of you. Because we need to make sure that we are not enablers to people that will take advantage. We don't want to enable people. We don't want to enable people by helping them when they should be helping themselves. You know, the old saying about fishing. Does anybody know what it is? Tell me. Teach a man fish for a day. What's that? Teach or give a man a fish, leave for a day. Teach a man to fish for a lifetime. Feed him for a lifetime. That's right. Yeah. And if you teach him how to fish, you can you can feed him for a lifetime. Give him a fish, and he'll eat for one day. Mm-hmm. It's better to teach people some things, right? So here is Paul saying, look, don't think that being loved is the criteria for helping people. Don't think that you that loving being loved back is the reason you're helping people. Well, it's not. But be it so, listen to what Paul said to, to reassure the people what he, where, where he was coming from. He said, but be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you, I caught you with guile. So he said, I, I wasn't in any way was I trying to burden you at all. In fact, he was cautious that he not did not want to cause them to be burdened. He was wanting them to know that what he was doing, he was doing out of love for God. He was not doing it to get anything in return. Now the word guile, I caught you with guile. How does it read in your version that you're reading there? It also has guile, so I also got the definition of it. Go ahead, read it. Sly, cunning, intelligence. Slight. Sly. Yeah. Sly and cunning. Doing it in the slight. People can be kind of, yeah, crafty. Another word for that is crafty. Not in a good sense. Guile. And so guile is the presence of unrighteousness in somebody's life. Not doing things for the righteous, for a righteous reason. Guile it could be sin, or it could just be the attitude of having unrighteousness in their lives. You know. So, uh, anything you got on that, Terry? Well, sure. and, uh, it reflected back under the, those false apostles again, and uh, said they could not bear the fact that Paul could. Uh, Paul didn't care about money. Again, it goes back to the money again, and you know they were saying that Paul had ulterior motives of everything he was doing, not only with the money, but also just for his actions approaching the Corinthians. Well, if you read this a little bit, like like you're pointing out, Terry, verse 17, did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? In other words, did I receive anything financially or any kind of gain from you and or from because of what I've done or by anybody that I sent to you, did I do it to receive anything from you? No. No, I did it. He did it because it was God that wanted him to do it. He wanted to help them in their relationship with God. Did I make a gain of you by any of them who's, whom I sent unto you? And in other words, look, you didn't give me anything to do this that would pay me back for how I loved you the way God wanted me to. And the people I sent to you to love you, to help you, didn't come back and give me anything that you gave them. That's pretty specific, isn't it? I'm doing this because I love God and I'm doing it God's way, not for gain. Verse 18. Go ahead, Terry, read that, would you? Uh, Verse 18 here is, um, I desired Titus. I was just getting ready to say that. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make... Make a gain of you? Walk we not in the same spirit? Walk we not in the same steps? So here he's already stating that, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, Paul, Paul had probably, you know, the Lord probably gave him the idea that this is probably going to happen here. So what did he do? He sent Titus and a brother along. They knew Titus. So Titus was from Corinth. And so they trusted Titus. But still, the Corinthians... With the help of those apostles, false apostles there, trying to uh, blame Paul for having ulterior motives with this whole third trip. And here Paul is saying, and this is a great thing to say about somebody, didn't Titus 
walk and that brother that came with him, didn't they walk in the same steps as we're walking in? Aren't they making the, doing things the same way that we do? Aren't they walking in the steps of God just like we are? They're not walking any differently than what we did. So the, Paul was trying to reassure them, no, he's not doing this for any other reason other than he loved God and this was God's purpose for him to set up these churches to help people to grow in the Lord. I think that's important that he got that point across. Anything else want to share on that, Terry? No, just that, uh, you know, love, love is just one thing that's really confusing. And this kind of brings us back to what we started with, that love is just, you know, something that has been damaged, you know, secularly, and all sorts of other confusion is brought in. So no wonder families have some confusion with their children when it, trying to understand what love be is because love isn't shown like it should be. In the well, not, and parents, we mess up sometimes. Yeah. We do mess up. One, and, and I've heard this before and I believe it and I've read it, don't ever punish your child <coughs> in anger. Wait a few minutes, let the anger settle, you know, and then, yeah. And one of the hardest things, and my dad and mom were good at this. My mom would always say, well, wait till your dad gets home. And, of course, she would, wouldn't mind using that switch a little bit anyway, but then she knew that dad would really take care of it. So, you know, but wait till your dad gets home. But I, I know that many times, I, I remember a time when, when I did something really goofy, like crossed the road in the middle of traffic or something. You know, and, and of course, they jerk you back and they spank your bottom on the spot. What are you doing? You want to get killed? And all of a sudden, that was a pretty harsh thing at the moment, but it was a necessary thing. They wanted me to know how dangerous that was. And so when you think about it, uh, and, it and I remember complaining to my parents. Maybe some of you have ever compl complained this way. Look, other kids are getting to stay out later than me. Did you, how many of you have said that? Me. Other kids are getting to stay out later than me. And you know, my dad's answer, I still remember this. He said, you know, these other parents might be letting their kids run the streets like hoodlums, but you're not a hoodlum, and I'm not going to let you become one. Whoa. <laughs> you know, and I thought about it. You know, some, of them, some of them are kind of hoodlums. I know. <laughs> and you know what? Here's something. He said, and, and another thing that went with it, I care for you. I love you. I care for you. And I'm not going to let you run the streets like they do. Now, that's important to know. Zach, you remember me saying something like that to you? Yeah. And let me tell you something. By the time the sun went down, you better be home. That was for sure. I mean, you did not let the sun go down on you before you and, and not be home. Some things may have changed. I don't know. How many of you remember that? Don't let the sun go down on you before you're home? Okay. I thought so. so and what? You better, right? If those lights are starting to come out already, you're already late. <laughs> so here, here was Titus making a point, though. Nobody's giving us anything to try to do the things we're doing. We're not getting any personal gain from this. I think about Paul with it. Well off before he would have been before the road to the He would have probably been well off before all that. Oh, yeah, Paul. Paul had an end with the, the Jewish leaders of the day. He was respected and honored by the Roman government enough to put him in charge of a group of soldiers that were going about arresting Christians. He had the connection. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the, the leading philosopher of the day. It's not like he didn't have connections. He didn't need the money that they would pay him to, to be wealthy. He could have been wealthy on his own. No, he, that's not the reason he was doing it. Very good point. Well, we better come to a close here. Did you have anything else you want to share about that? No, we pretty well finished uh, everything I had down here. We talked about a, a footnote that I put in here that I was going to bring out, but we talked about Titus and mm -hmm. uh, just that the church recognized him as uh, a trustworthy man. And so, but Just think about that. Yeah. Paul was using somebody that already had a connection to Corinth to be able to get the word. Now that's important to know that. Listen, if you want to help, if you want to help get a situation straightened out, if you can use somebody that the people already know or have some confidence in, that's a good thing. Okay? So if you having if you're having problems with issues with other people at work or and communication problems with people around you, 
you could if you if you have somebody you can trust and somebody that they already trust, this can be a good communication for you to to break some barriers down. It's a good it's a good principle. And I don't think Paul learned about these principles secondhand. I think he learned of some of these principles from people that were very intelligent, like Gamaliel, you know, a great philosopher. Some of these things that could be done, he was a great communicator. Paul was a great communicator. So he knew God how to get things done. And what? God was building him up for the role. He was it's amazing. If you look back, and I'm sure that you know he knew seven different languages, probably spoke, spoke them fluently. And he was a man that was, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was born a Hebrew. He was born a Roman citizen. He was, in, he was a leader uh, of, the, of the Jewish leaders. He was one of those trusted people that they had confidence in. Do you think this was all an accident? Don't you think he kind of looked, looked back and thought, wow, look what God was doing. And God, he was leading me before I even knew him. Now you can look back and think, I think God was trying to get my attention all along. And I think God let these things happen just so I could be used better and more for God. Who would ever have thought that? Who would, who would ever think, and you don't think this, but when you're younger and bad things happen, even when you're older and bad things happen, you don't, you don't put it together like, how could this ever be good? You know, we're looking at it like, this is terrible, you know. I wish I'd have never gone through this. But did you know through the adversities of life, some of the best things happen with people. And they learn some of the most useful things and, and some of the best creations and some of the best moments in their lives have been because of the adversity that they have gone through. You can take some comfort in that. Some of the worst moments in my life have brought about some of the best things in my life. And you could probably say that too. So anyway, let's come to a close. Terry, did you want to uh, say anything else? I don't want to cut anybody off. Anybody else have anything to share? Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Katie, would you just let us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Bible study and this time we shared together tonight. And let your word follow with us as we leave here tonight. Um, please bless and protect everybody here and that are not here. And watch over us as we go throughout the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Katie. Well, God bless you all. Be sure you get some pizza. If you didn't get any pizza, get some now, okay? And there's cookies. Did anybody open here? Yeah. Okay, good. Get some cookies. Those are something like.